Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to our worship this morning. We're glad you're with us. If we do have any visitors, we're especially glad that you are with us this morning. Hope you feel welcome. We do ask anyone that's present with us here that is visiting might fill out one of the blue visitor cards you'll find in the uh, back of the pew there in front of you. Leave it with us, please. A couple of announcements that may not have made it onto the overhead. Um, as we did announce for a few weeks, Brother Dan Winkler was to be with us this morning and deliver a message, but uh, this week we did find out Dan was, he found out that he was diagnosed with colon cancer this past Wednesday, I believe, and uh, he's scheduled for surgery tomorrow. So he and his family would, uh, of course, appreciate our prayers. So please remember Dan and the whole family there. Also, Dan Hazlip. He expects to be released to return home today. He's been having a lot of chest pain and some other things and uh, found out that uh, maybe an infection in his toe was causing some of this. Dan is diabetic, ended up having to have uh, one toe amputated uh, and did seem to maybe relieve some of his uh, symptoms there. So uh, hope that settles it for Dan. He's supposed to return home today, but please remember Dan in your prayers. Dean Hughes is scheduled to have outpatient rotator cuff surgery on her right soldier, excuse me, shoulder on Tuesday, February 2nd at Murray Regional Medical Center. Tina Kelso, good friends with Kathy Sisk, uh, Tina Kelso continues to battle COVID-19. She has been seriously ill with the virus and has shown some improvement during the last week. Scheduled for some tests on her lungs tomorrow and uh, they do request prayers that uh, there will be some improvement seen there. Also, prayers are requested for Jenna and Brian Sanders. Jenna works with Biff at Lawrenceburg Federal with Biff and Billy, and Brian is her husband. They both have had COVID. As uh, a matter of fact, Jenna is in regional Murray Regional Hospital. Her oxygen levels have dropped, so they've also had the flu in tandem with the, the COVID, so please remember the Sanders family in your, your prayers also. Again, we welcome everyone who may be uh, with us this morning or worshiping online with us or who may hear this this evening about six o'clock on the local radio. Uh, we thank you for your presence. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. We can begin our worship service. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing us to come together this morning in worship and in edification of one another. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us toward those things that are most needful. Please help all those that have been mentioned this morning uh, around the world who come together to worship you. Please uh, let everyone have the strength to continue to strive to do those things that, that fit your will. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Number 388. Let every heart rejoice and sing. 388. We'll sing both verses. Following this song, we will be led in prayer once again by Shane Hughes. Let every heart rejoice and sing, let choral anthems rise. Ye aged men and children, bring to God your sacrifice. For he is good, the Lord is good, and kind are all his ways. With songs and honors sounding loud, the the Lord Jehovah praise. While the rocks and the rills, while the vales and the hills are glorious and the rays, let each prolong the great false song and the God of our fathers praise. And the God of our fathers praise. He bids the sun to rise and set. In heaven his power is known. And earth subdued to him shall yet bow low before his throne. For he is good, the Lord is good, and kind are all his ways. With songs and honors sounding loud, 
the Lord Jehovah praise. While the rocks and the rills, while the vales and the hills are glorious and them raise, let each prolong the great ball song and the God of our fathers praise, and the God of our fathers praise. Shall we bow as we pray? Father in heaven, we're so thankful to be here today. Father, as we assemble here together as Christians, Father, we're here to give you the praise that you deserve, Father, through our songs and through our prayer, through studying thy word. Father, we hope that everything we do here today is offered up as a sweet fragrance to you and, and done in a way that's pleasing in thy sight. Father, first and foremost, we're so thankful for everything you do for us. From the start of creation to today, Father, we know that you know, your handiworks abound, that you are with us at all times. And Father, most importantly, that you've laid out a plan that gives us a path that we may one day, while we seek you, find a home with thee in heaven. Father, we know to, to make that possible, that... There was a great sacrifice, not only made by you, but by your one and only son as he came here to live as a man, to show us what an example the perfect life looks like, and then, Father, to put the ultimate sacrifice upon that cross, where he gave his body and he shed his blood so that each of us have that opportunity. Father, we're so thankful for that, what it means to us as Christians. Help us not only to remember that daily as we walk, this walk here on this earth, but to also show others what it's like to be Christians and to show them the opportunity that you've given to all. Father, we're thankful for this church and what it means to us here, the ability to spend time with each other, to lay our burdens upon each other, to also share in good times and bad. Father, what it means to have brothers and sisters in Christ to lean upon. Father, we're thankful for what it means to us to have good leadership, how our elders work to guide us, to make sure that we're provided with the, the daily milk and to always be there in times of need. Father, we're thankful for those of our congregation that are able to work with the children to provide guidance through teaching and instruction the many activities that we do. We're thankful for Jeremy and Katie and how they labor with the kids here at Pulaski Street. We're also thankful for a dedicated and faithful minister in Jacob and his family and how they've been here working with us diligently to continue to provide the word and, and to show us what it's like and, and the instructions that you've given us, Father, to be Christians. Father, we know that there are many amongst our group that can't be here today we know a lot of that's related to the COVID virus and the results of this pandemic that we're living in. Father, we know it's impacted our church family. We know it's impacted our communities. We know it's impacted the country and the world in which we live. Father, I ask that we all look upon this time as a, a way to get closer to thee, to, to be able to understand uh, how important it is that we can you know, worship freely in a country like this, but not only that, the, the benefits of being able to worship in times when we are, we're not dealing with a virus like this. Father, as we come out of this uh, pandemic with the vaccines that are going around and the immunity that we're developing, Father, I ask that you would be with everyone that's uh, here in this building and those that are worshiping at home and help us to, to be strong as we come back to understand how important it is as Christians to be able to come here and worship and to be with each other and uh, hopefully father nobody neglects that that we all continue to come back as we can and, and continue to live faithful lives to thee father I also ask that you would be with those of our group that are hurting uh, through many things in their life through the loss of loved ones through hardship during these times some some it could be sickness some it could be loss of jobs uh, but father we all know that this life is short 
that we have just a, a short amount of time here and that at some point in time we all go through those hardships in life. And Father, I pray that we all um, stand tall and stand firm when it comes our time to be leaned upon and that we have somebody that is there for us when it comes our time to lean upon someone else. Uh, just always be with us and help us with that. Now, Father, as we continue in this worship service, we will offer more songs of praise to thee and take more time in prayer and study thy word. Father, I ask that you would be with us all and help us to tune out the things of this world, to focus on you, to give you our heart, our minds, and our time here today as we go through this worship service. And again, that we do everything in a well-pleasing sight. Father, I ask all these things through your son's name, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. For the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 495, O the Depth and the Riches. All three verses of this song and following that, Mac Evans will preside over the Lord's Supper elements. <clears throat> oh, the depth and the riches of God's saving grace Flowing down from the cross for me There the debt for my sins by the Savior was paid In his suffering on Calvary Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free. And the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. How my heart humbly bows in his presence today when I think of his agony. By his stripes I am freed from the bondage of sin through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love flowing boundless and full and free. And the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love, what immeasurable grace I see. By his blood I am cleansed, I am happy and free through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free. And the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. As the overhead shows, it's time for communion. We meet around this table once again on the first day of the week. And I thought about that this, this week and something stood out to me that I guess I've considered but hadn't considered before. I guess that's because I'm not very smart. Because if you notice, it's wintertime and I, I don't wear a coat. And when it's raining, I don't wear a coat or umbrella or a hat. So, you know, I don't have enough sense coming out of the rain. But uh, <clears throat> as I look to the Lord's Supper, the communion, this feast, and when Jesus inaugurated this event, A word came to mind that I haven't contemplated before. Simplicity. The words of our Lord were very simple and easy to understand. As we study through the Bible, there are scriptures and 
that's hard to understand. Some things we may never understand this side of eternity. But the Lord's Supper is not one of those. It's simple. And the Lord used simple items. Back when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he picked two items, the bread and the fruit of the vine, or the juice of, of grapes. I would suppose and I would say that bread and grapes without exaggeration were two items that were necessary for survival back in those times. These two items were very simple and in a real way they used and our Lord used simple essential foods that associated with survival and Jesus declared to his disciples that they should remember how essential he was to their survival. You know in communion we do many things. One of those things is to declare our awareness and understanding that we could not survive without Jesus. Without Jesus, we couldn't be forgiven. Without Jesus, we couldn't come to God. Without Jesus, we couldn't be in God's family. And without Jesus, we would spiritually die. So I'm impressed this morning by the simplicity of Jesus' words. Luke 22 and 19, Jesus simply says, and it is written, And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I think there's a very basic and simple point. When you eat this bread, remember me. Remember my physical body. And at that time, his physical body was to be very soon killed in a horrible manner. But Jesus' love for them and for us took his body to the cross. And Jesus' love for them and for us, kept his body on the cross. So this day, let's remember the simple words of Jesus. Take, eat, this is my body. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the day, for this moment in time that we can participate in this feast. We're thankful for the bread and we're thankful for the body that was sacrificed in our place. And we do this in remembrance of him who died for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Jesus took a cup of grape juice or wine. If it was around harvest time, it was probably grape juice. If it was way after harvest, it was probably wine. But Jesus took a cup and thanked God and told all of his disciples to drink from the cup. And just as the bread symbolized his body that soon would be sacrificed in crucifixion, the contents of the cup symbolize his blood that soon would be poured from his body to the ground. 
And with the same simplicity, he made two statements about his blood. He said it was the blood of the new covenant. He said it was the blood which would be sacrificed so that many could receive the remission of sins. And later on, Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians concerning Jesus' blood in Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. So as we partake of this fruit of the vine, remember Jesus' blood and remember it with joy and appreciation. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank thee this day for the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Jesus. We thank you for sending him. We thank him for letting himself be nailed to the cross and allowing himself to remain on the cross. And with that sacrifice, we have remission of sins. We take of this in remembrance again of him who died for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 70, Be Thou My Vision, 7 0. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. <clears throat> Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom be thou my true word i ever with thee and thou with me lord thou my great father i thy true son thou in me dwelling and i with thee one i king of heaven when victory is won may i reach heaven's joys o bright and sun heart of my heart whatever befall still be my vision o ruler of all same opening, number 71. If you would like to mark your hymn book, you can go ahead and mark that as number 389. Let him have his way with thee. Number 71. I guess we missed one. Let's go ahead. If you have a book, uh, you can open up to number 71, Blessed Assurance. We'll sing this song before the overhead only song. All three verses of number 71, Blessed Assurance. <clears throat> All right. 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. As I mentioned before, 389 let him have his way with thee will be the invitation song after Jacob's lesson and at the appropriate time. We'll sing all three verses of that song. And then if you're able, let's stand as we sing one that will be on the overhead only. Pierce my ear. Following this song, you may be seated. We will have a scripture reading from Matthew Dickey before Jacob comes to present the sermon this morning. <clears throat> Pierce my ear, O Lord, my God. Take me to your door this day. I will serve no other God. Lord, I'm here to stay. for me with your blood you ransomed me now I will serve you eternally a free man I'll never be so pierce my ear oh my God, take me to your door this day. I will serve no other God. Lord, I'm here to stay. Today I will be reading Proverbs 11.3, Proverbs 11.3. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Before we get into the lesson, a couple things. One, 
Oh, it's good to see all of you. We got, it feels like slowly, but surely, more human beings are coming back in here. Familiar faces, people I like to see, you know. See Mr. Billy over here. It's good to see him. Got his arm around uh, another Billy, Billy Four. There's like a lot of Billies on that bench there. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, Darren, great to see you. Allison. And yes, you too, Brent and Emily. It's good to see you too. No. <laughs> really good to see you. I know this last year and a half for Darren has been, uh, it's been many things um, and been good. But uh, he's here, still going. Good to see so many of you. I know that uh, between myself and Biff and Tim, at least that I talked to this last week, I kind of kind of made a little personal goal that starting in this new year, I'd start each week, you know, and the hecticness of trying to get lessons and online stuff to um, reach out to those I hadn't seen in a while. Just know that a lot of those that aren't with us want to be here. Okay, they do. Um, we, we have been kind of amazed at how many people are listening to the 6 o'clock Sunday evening radio broadcast. We've de- we have decided that might have been one of the better decisions we made a year ago because we have so many of our elderly folks who are taking advantage of that and are appreciative of that, uh, not to mention the online services. So, um, and, you know, talking to some of them have said, once I get my second vaccine, I will see you there. So that's, that's can, that can be a reason why more and more folks are coming in. Um, But uh, let's continue our prayers and our thoughtfulness for those that are battling this and that are trying to stay safe from it. Second thing I want to do is I want to have a prayer. I want to have a prayer for Dan Winkler specifically. Um, Adele Jenkins uh, reached out through Facebook to any and all preachers and churches to pray for Dan because tomorrow he will go in and they are targeting a spot, a cancerous spot on his colon in hopes that they can remove that threat. And uh, so he... He texted me Wednesday night. I was leaving the office. I'd get, I'd just got in my car, and I got the text from Dan that he would not be able to be with us today as we expected because he had just got the news of what had happened, and he still hadn't had a chance to tell his family. So we kept it under wraps for a couple of days until I started he texted Tim to let him know what was going on. And then before you know it, as I kind of expected, Facebook started blowing up as folks that have been impacted by Dan through his preaching at Creve Hall, through his teaching at Freed Hardeman, through his meeting work all across the country uh, and lectureships and all of this, so many people thinking about him. So let's just have a, a brief prayer and then we'll get into the lesson. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we lift up before you Dan Winkler who has done so much to encourage people, to teach people, to challenge people with your word. We pray that his surgery tomorrow uh, goes even better than planned, uh, that the threat is removed, that he and Diane and his, his uh, family, his boys uh, can rest easy. Uh, We pray that you will be with him, of course, no matter what, uh, through his recovery and as he learns uh, what the way forward is going to look like. Uh, We thank you for your faithfulness, and we pray for your faithfulness towards your servant, Dan. And it's in his, it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, Um, so after the rigors and torture of a North Korean prison camp, Major General William F. Dean was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, and he has been described as one of America's greatest heroes. But one day during his imprisonment, he was told by his captors that he was going to be executed. Now, it was a scare tactic in hopes of getting some information from him, wasn't going to be carried out. He obviously lived to get the Medal of Honor. But as far as he knew, 
He didn't have much long, much longer, and so he composed a letter to his wife, a letter that you can read. And of all the things he said in the letter, the thing that just, there's one line that just stands out in that letter, and it was just this short sentence of advice to his son. And here's what he said. Tell Bill. The word is integrity. That's, think about this now. There's a major general that isn't going to give up information, showing some pretty intense integrity, and he, he, his advice to his son was one word, integrity. Now that word, or English word integrity, comes from a word you might have heard of before, integer. Now, we don't, we don't throw that around a lot, but if you've, you know, going through school, you come across this word in your mathematics studies, mathematical, it's a mathematical term, meaning a complete or single number, a number that is not divided. Thus, the moral application, which is reflected in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that a person of integrity has a single purpose. He is whole. His or her principles are not divided. He or she adheres to convictions. His loyalties, her loyalties, are not shared. The course is steady. To quote James, he is not double-minded or unstable in all his ways. He is not two-faced. He avoids deception and expediency. Simply put, he is a man of character. She is a woman of character. What we're going to do this morning just to explore this idea of integrity and what it looks like, we're going to look at a handful of verses from the book of Proverbs. Just a handful of them, okay? That handful in my thinking is five okay so we're gonna look at five single verses from the book of proverbs make some comments illustrate them and the lesson will be yours so here's the first one comes to us from proverbs 10 and verse 9 whoever walks in integrity walks securely or confidently or some might even translate this carefree but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out now this reflects our experience does it not when we maintain our integrity and re we refuse to be duplicitous or hypocritical when we maintain a disciplined and steady course, we have nothing to fear. We have, no, we have no skeletons in the closet, as it were, when we maintain our integrity. Right? In fact, a, maybe a short way to just sort of summarize this verse is nothing to hide, nothing to fear. However, if you or I compromise our integrity, and let's say that our compromise initially goes undetected, well, that could work on us. Yeah, we're, we're waiting for the tiger to pounce at any moment. We're waiting at any moment to be found out because we failed morally. We, we compromised our integrity. So we can choose security. Or we can choose insecurity. I like the idea of security. I like the idea of walking confidently. I like the idea of walking carefree. And if you like that idea, then it pays to be a person of character and integrity. Here's the second one, the one that um, Matthew just read for us. Proverbs 11, verse 3. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. The point is that 
Integrity will cause a person to make the right choices and to go in the right direction. In contrast, one who lacks integrity, one who is crooked, perverse, dishonest, or hypocritical, such a person will thereby be led to ruin. The two sides of this proverb are straightness in the place of crookedness, sincerity in the place of hypocrisy, consistency in the place of compromise, and honor in the place of infidelity. Now, a story is told, it's a true story, of a man named Ruben Gonzalez. He was in the final match of his first professional racquetball tournament. I don't know how many, many of you played racquetball. Remember my dad played some racquetball back in his maybe 30s and 40s somewhere? I don't think he's picked up a racket in a while. But Ruben Gonzalez is in the final match of his first professional racquetball tournament. And he was playing the perennial champion for his first shot at a victory on the pro circuit. So it's kind of the newcomer is is playing the champion. At match point in the fifth and final game, Gonzalez made a super kill shot into the front corner to win the tournament. The referee called it good. The uh, the the one one of the linemen confirmed the shot was a winner. But after a moment's hesitation, Gonzalez turned and declared that his shot had actually skipped and hit the wall. Hit the floor first. And as a result of this, the serve went to his opponent who went on to win the match. Ruben Gonzalez walked off the court and everyone was stunned. Now this is going to blow your mind. There was actually a magazine called National Racquetball Magazine. Look who's on the front. Ruben Gonzalez. Look at this over here. Y'all see that? It skipped. In the magazine, the lead editorial searched and questioned for an explanation for the first ever occurrence on the professional racquetball circuit. Who could imagine ever imagine it in any sport or endeavor. Here was a player, okay, with everything official in his favor. If he kept his mouth shut, guess what, guys? He would have beat the champion. I mean, he had victory in his grasp. All he had to do was just not say what he saw. When asked why he did it, this is what Gonzalez replied. It was the only thing I could do to maintain my integrity. Sometimes, sometimes it can be difficult to allow our integrity to guide us. Now, if you don't believe that's true, let's go to a brief biblical example. Book of Job. Job is often remembered for his patience or his steadfastness. But let me ask you a question. What is it that allowed him? What, what was a big contributing factor to his steadfastness and his patience? Have you ever considered this? It was his integrity. Satan tested him with loss of family and possessions. But God said of Job... In the good old King James Version, he holdeth fast his integrity. Job 2 verse 3. And when his wife wanted him to curse God, she knew that he would never do it as long as he maintained his integrity. And we are especially impressed because this is the bulk of the book. He's got friends, okay, that are ganging up on him with every moral and theological argument that they can muster. You're a big fat sinner, Job. 
Just repent and it'll be all over. And Job kept telling them in essence, I have done nothing to deserve this. And if I admit to doing something wrong that I haven't actually done, then I would be doing something wrong. Then I would be compromising my integrity. Isn't it true that sometimes the greatest threat to integrity comes from the persuasiveness of others, especially those closest to us? And especially when their view seems to be the majority view. 50 fans can't be wrong, can they? You know. There's an experiment that was done. Maybe you remember this experiment or heard of this experiment, but it, it was a good one. A professor drew four lines on a whiteboard. One was labeled X, and the others were labeled A, B, and C. He asked the class to pick the line that was the same length as X. But all of the class except one student had been instructed secretly to give the wrong answer. In numerous cases, when this experiment was carried out, the one student was persuaded to switch to the majority view even though it was obviously incorrect. He's like, that's obviously C. And then everybody in his class pops up and says, what? No, nah, it's actually A. And he's, you can imagine him going, maybe I don't know what I'm looking at. I mean, and so often one person after another would say, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, it's A, when it's so obviously C. Such was not the case with Job, though. His answer to his critics in Job 27, 5. God forbid that I should justify you till I die. I will not remove mine integrity from me. Job was guided by his integrity. And we should be too. No matter how difficult it might be to do it. Here's a third one. Proverbs 27, the righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. All right, parents. I know we got parents. We got several parents. How many of you have considered what, what's the best legacy to leave your children? It's the best. According to Proverbs 20, verse 7, one of your answers ought to be what? Integrity. There is a guy named Brian Hickey. Uh, he wrote for this outfit online group called Philly Voice. And he reports on the strange case of Mr. Black, who required two obituaries. You ever heard of such? Now, this is an extreme case, but he had two obituaries. In the first obit, his loving wife, Beretta Harrison Black, gets top survivor billing. And then in his second, Beretta is nowhere to be found in his obituary. She's not there. In fact, in her place is longtime girlfriend, Princess Hall, had two obituaries, two separate obituaries. In fact, the wife and the girlfriend mutually decided, hey, I'm going to get my own obituary with him. You're going to get your own obituary. We are not appearing in the same obituary. Now, do you think that's an extreme example of, of leaving a lack of integrity on this legacy, right? I mean, you've got, you got, you got two obviously, it's like you got two men, right? You're, you're, one, you're one person to this group. And, and, and you're one person to this group. You, you're one persona here, one persona here. And it's just, it's just a wedge between the two. If all you and I 
or able to leave our children when our life is over. Now listen to me now. If we are able to leave them anything, this is more important than leaving them money or an estate or, or whatever. You want to leave them integrity. You do. I promise you. Charles Spurgeon takes this thought even further. He says, our integrity may be God's means of saving our sons and daughters. If they see the truth of our religion proved by our lives, it may be that they will believe in Jesus for themselves. Proverbs 25, 26, number four. Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. There's been a couple of ways that folks have interpreted this. Some believe it refers to the integrity of the righteous being lost. Others think it has to do with the righteous man who loses his integrity essentially becomes useless. Derek Kidner says, A good man's defection in perils or at best deprives the many who have learnt to rely on him. Having compromised his influence, instead of becoming or being a refreshing spring to people because of his integrity and character, he becomes to those who once admired him a lukewarm cesspool. It's pretty, pretty graphic imagery here from the wise man. Number five, the last one. Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Now, not a few people in our society would scoff at this proverb, would just laugh at it, mock it, insult it. It hardly seems, or hardly needs to be argued that genuine integrity is unfortunately a rare commodity when you're looking at society or the world at large. It seems so scarce in politics, for example, that hypocrisy is often assumed before it is uncovered. And what shall we say of cheating in school or cheating in marriage or of shoddy workmanship or failure to pay debts or padding expense accounts or broken promises or tax fraud. Will Rogers said the income tax has made more liars out of American people than golf has. <laughs> Moral compromise is seemingly the order of the day for many people. Pluralism, moral relativism, leave no room for genuine integrity. One survey reported that of 3,000 businessmen, 70% said they were expected at least occasionally to compromise their principles to conform to their company's or their boss's demands. Do y'all know that this happens? Do y'all know that there's Christians that are trying to do an honest day's labor, who are working hard, and then they get asked from on high, from a supervisor or a boss to do something that cuts right across everything they stand for? Have y'all ever had to deal with that before? I got a guy over in, over in East Tennessee that... Brittany and I love him and his family. I remember him coming to me at Greenback and saying, Hey, Jacob, I got to talk to you. I'm, I got a good job. I, I got a kid. I got another kid on the way. I, and my, my boss, my, my superiors are asking me to do something that's just, it, it's not right. I don't want to lose my job, but I don't want to compromise my integrity. 
And he didn't. And he didn't compromise his integrity. And he got out of that job. And he found another one. And he's doing just fine. Moreover, in this survey, they ranked reputation for firm moral and or ethical conviction at the bottom of a list of factors considered in awarding promotions. So yeah, there's a lot of people in our society that would scoff at this proverb. But with this proverb, we are guided. We are called to be guided by that moral and spiritual simplicity that is not complicated or compromised by either circumstances or enticements. Let's illustrate this point. A man was asked to lie to help close a business deal. And he refused. Would you do it for $50? Certainly not. It would not be right. Well, how about for $100? The answer is still no. I'll give you $1,000. Let me think about it. Integrity that wavers as the stakes are raised ceases to be integrity. In contrast to this, we can note an incident in the life of raccoon John Smith. He was a notable preacher in the early years of the Restoration Movement, with which many here are familiar with. After he had bought a farm in Kentucky, friends advised him not to preach so strongly, or else his brethren would get so angry that they would quit paying him, and he would lose his farm. Imagine the preacher comes in, buys a farm, he's getting his family set up, and then some brethren come to him and say, you're going to have to dial it back. You've got to stop preaching on this, you've got to stop this, you, got, you can't be preaching on that and all this. And let me just let you know that if you don't stop, we're going to stop paying you, and then you're not going to have a farm anymore. Here's what Raccoon John Smith said. Conscience is an article that I have never brought to the market. But should I offer it for sale, Montgomery County, with all of its land, and all of its houses, would not be enough to buy it, much less this farm of 100 acres. I'm going to ask you a penetrating question. Is there a dollar amount that you could name for which you would be willing to compromise your integrity? The world will always be the world. That's just how it's going to be. But in the Lord's church, in this church family and other church families we could name, integrity ought to be the rule and not the exception. The oft-repeated charge, sometimes true, sometimes exaggerated, that there are hypocrites in the church, is actually itself evidence that Christians are expected to walk by a higher standard. So let's hear the wisdom of Proverbs this morning. And let's resolve to be people of integrity. Let's resolve to be like these rocks. Got all these waves crashing against them. Big and small. But they remain steadfast. And by the way, aren't you glad that Jesus was a man of integrity? Aren't you glad? Because he was, 
two really important things. One, I can trust everything that comes out of his mouth. And number two, I can trust his sacrifice. Right? I can trust his sacrifice. I can trust that he was unblemished. I can trust he didn't fail. I can trust he didn't sin because he was such a man of integrity. And I can know that in that simple memorial we took, we, we partook of this morning, that it rings true and it rings effective. This morning, it may be. It may be that you are a Christian, you need a new start. That's what's beautiful. As long as you've got breath in your lungs, you can right this ship. Perhaps you've compromised your integrity here. You've compromised your integrity there. And you're ready to turn this around. We will accommodate you. We will pray with you and for you. And it may be that you're not a Christian this morning. The greatest thing you can ever do is become one. And then seek to live a life of integrity before God and before others. And if you happen to have children, uh, you can leave them something far better than the world's goods. If we can help you in any way this morning, come now together we stand and sing. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see twas best for him to have his way with thee would you have him make you free and follow at his call would you know the peace that comes by giving all would you have him save you so that you need never fall let him have his way with thee his power can make you what you ought to be his blood can cleanse your heart and make you free his love can fill your soul and you will see twas best for him to have his way with thee would you in his kingdom find a place of constant rest would you prove him true each providential test would you in his service labor always at your best let him have his way with thee his power can make you what you ought to be his blood can cleanse your heart and make you free his love can fill your soul and you will see twas best for him to have his way with thee thank you jacob fantastic lesson this morning on Less notice than usual, as was mentioned, of course, please do keep Brother Winkler in your prayers as he goes in for surgery on his colon tomorrow to hopefully remove all of the cancer that they have found and also in the steps that will be taken following that as they try to make sure that they are able to restore him to full health. A couple of things that I would like to mention. First, we do have 155 here in person this morning. We're thankful for your presence. We have had many that are also viewing online, and we thank you for being with us as well. As you are exiting, you may place your contribution in the appropriate basket on the way out. Also, please throw away your communion in the trash cans as you leave. It is really good to be back. Um, I have missed being here, and I've, of course, uh, my family is not here this morning, and they will be uh, by next week, hopefully, good Lord willing. Uh, but there have been so many of you that have reached out, that have brought things to us, that have helped out in many different ways, and thank you very much for that. I've had a lot of folks that have helped with our teens on Wednesday nights in Bible class. Uh, we've, had, we've been watching the Evangelism University series of videos. 
Uh, but we've had multiple people that have gone and, and helped. We uh, had Shane Adams and Joe Cook that have both helped with making sure some of those videos were available and up going over there in the fellowship building. Uh, Tim and Brad and Ethan uh, Cooper have all helped with sitting over there and making sure that there were adults present in there. And I thank you all so much for that. And uh, a special thank you to Carter Hughes. There's a, there's a discussion portion of those lessons and these last few Wednesdays that I've been gone, Carter has taken the lead on that each of those weeks, and I really appreciate that and that leadership that he has shown in that way. Those of you that are interested in CYC, I have, I have received several of the letters. Remember that you have to have that turned in along with the $30 a person in order for your sign-up process to be complete. There are a few of those letters that explain a little bit about the situation that we are going to be uh, in with that and if you have any other questions, my contact info is on that letter if you don't already have it. Our last song will be number 265, I Love Thee So. We'll sing the first verse of this song, and following that, Olin Springer will lead us in a closing prayer and also remember the contribution at that time. My Savior dear, I love thee, oh, I love thee, for thou hast made my blinded eyes to see, redeemed my soul upon the cross of Calvary, and mim the bonds of sin hath made me free. I now am happy in thy loving favor. I would that others this great love should know. I'll praise thy name throughout the endless ages. My Savior dear, my Savior dear, I love thee so. Would you bow with me, please? Lord, we thank you so much for this day, for the opportunity we've had to come the first day of the week to worship you in spirit and in truth, to hear a lesson brought to us by Brother Jacob, and we thank you for his abilities to spread thy gospel and for Jeremy and the leading of songs and his work with the youth and all, all the members here that gathered today or online we ask that you be with them tend to their needs as only you know how lord we know that you are a loving caring and giving god and we just thank you so much for that and at the close of this hour we have an opportunity to give back to you and may we do it with a loving and cheerful and content heart and all things i ask in christ's name amen <laughs>